Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's World Philosophy Day. I'm here with my favorite, Dr. Catherine Kalaitis, and also your favorite as well. My name is Kyra Dye, and I'm, I'm Manager of Special Events at the National Hellenic Museum. Katie is our resident scholar and is phenomenal. And uh, today we're just going to do a little bit of a chat about philosophy in the world and in our own lives. This is a little bit more casual compared to a lot of the online talks that we've done lately. Um, but we're just going to talk about philosophy for World Philosophy Day, and we hope that you all enjoy our conversation. Um, yeah. Happy World Philosophy Day, Cairo. Happy World Philosophy Day. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. What is philosophy, Katie, if, in your opinion? What, how would you describe philosophy? So philosophy comes from a Greek word, um, two Greek words actually, philos, which means friend or love, and sophia, which means wisdom. I so love that. philosophy is the love of wisdom. And philosophy is, I mean, if you think about it, people have probably been doing philosophy for as long as we've been people in any meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So um, even, you know, even like the Neanderthals, right? You see, we, any, any culture where they bury their dead, um, they probably have some kind of religion. And mm -hmm. if they have some kind of religion, they have some kind of philosophy, right? So they've thought yeah. about these big questions. Which actually brings me to another question that maybe we'll contemplate a little bit later, but I do want to like contemplate that question of like, what is the difference? Is there one between- I, I, I have an answer for you that I give my students. So ask that, ask that question next, because I, I have a, I have a bad answer. Um, Coming shortly. That has some jokes to it too. Ooh. Um, but philosophy, so, so people have always philosophized, right? The so people have always, as long as they've been, we've been people in a meaningful way, um, and there's lots of conversations about why that is, um, people have been doing philosophy. Philosophy as, a, as an academic discipline, as a structured discipline, um, emerges in Greece, in Athens, really, in the fifth century. Um, there are, there's something called pre-Socratic philosophers, and we kind of lump them together. Um, and they, they kind of date from the seventh, eighth century BCE, in and around Athens, usually, that there's some in Asia Minor, some from Crete. Um, but what we, the, the origins of really the excellent philosophical texts that we have come from fifth century Athens. Um, Socrates, of course, who's the sort of people point to as that marker, right? Pre-Socratic, post-Socratic, that marker of a person. Um, he wrote nothing. Um, instead, what we have are the texts of his students and their students. And the reason we know so much kind of about him is because he was used as a character in their philosophical dialogues. So they wrote dialogues, they wrote sort of short stories that explored philosophical points. So that's true of Plato, that's true of Aristotle, that's true of Xenophon. It's, it, I mean, dialogues <laughs> is also just a thing that then Christianity picks up for a long time. It's a lot of what I studied in school. Uh, 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 context for our audience. I studied medieval history in school not what I do in my job now, but it is what I studied in school. And so that's, I mean, that's something that continues. Many of the, the, the great theologians use dialogues as a way to examine religious doctrine or teaching as well. So that's a form that continues for a good long while. I think there's a reason for that. Um, Socrates' yeah. great discovery, the great discovery attributed to Socrates is um, the Socratic method, right? So arriving at these conclusions through questioning and the dialogue is a, is a literary form that allows you to do that in print. So there is this idea that, that develops in, in Greek philosophy and really is shared with the Western and Islamic world, becomes the primary mode of philosophical discourse in both um, the Western world, both Greco-Roman and then later the Christian world, and then also in the Islamic world. Um, the primary mode of philosophical discourse really is, or the primary literary form of, phil of philosophy is an attempt to replicate the, the Socratic dialogue. Um, to yeah, I mean, there, and that there are lots of variants, like the like Constellation of Philosophy from Boethius is, is structured in that way in many ways. I mean, how else do you, I mean, you can do philosophy other ways, right? I mean, obviously you can write like a treatise and people do. Um, there certainly are philosophical treatises that lay out the points of a, of a philosophical argument. But I think probably the most natural way, and I think this goes back to like sort of philosophies, not just ancient, but sort of prehistoric roots, 
um, the most natural way to talk about philosophy is the way we all philosophize, right? Sitting around talking to each other. Yeah, and I and I think that's actually a, a big fabric of our lives, whether we label it as philosophy or not. Um, I mean, yeah. Sorry, I mean, like anyone who's been anyone who's had a few drinks on a Friday night with friends and started, you know, sat around and talked about being there. Yeah, talking about their 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 perspective on life and what it means. Um, yeah. I know that I I don't think my dad would call himself a philosopher, but I would certainly call him that, perhaps. Um, we I think we're we are going to talk a little bit more about philosophy in our own lives a little bit later. Um, but at the moment, let's let's go back to that other question that I just proposed of of the difference is there one between philosophy and religion? How are they related? How are they different? Um, so anthropology. At, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Sorry. Um, anthropologists have a really strict definition of religion, mm -hmm. the technical definition of religion. And the easiest way to remember that is religion is myth plus ritual. Mm -hmm. So religion is a, a set of stories that have a philosophical underpinning, right? That have an ideological underpinning. We tend to use ideology in the terms of modern political philosophy, but um, have a have a more you know some morality about life right a way you should live your or an understanding of the world if not an ethics which is a branch of behaviors a branch of philosophy so a, a worldview a philosophy those myths those stories have a worldview mm -hmm. have a philosophy um, there's an epist every every religion has an epistemology right it has a way of of discerning what knowledge is and how knowledge is acquired. So um, within the Christian tradition, that is God. In the Orthodox tradition, in fact, we worship God the Father as the Hagia Sophia, as the holy wisdom, mm -hmm. right? Um, and Christ as logos, as reason. Yep. Um, this speaks to the, the Hellenistic roots, the Hellenist, Hellenist mm -hmm. roots of, of Christianity. Um, so there's, every religion has an epistemology. Um, most religions, I would say every religion has a, um, has an ethics, right? Has a system of ethics of behaviors that are forbidden and behaviors that are compelled. Um, those are all part of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, those are branches of philosophy and religions have those. In religions, those tend to be communicated primarily through their, through their muthos, through their myths, their stories. Yeah. Well, religion has an addition because just stories is a book club. Come to the National Hellenic Museum book club every third Thursday. Um, uh, just a collection of stories is a book club, right? Mm -hmm. um, what religion has in addition is ritual, things you do. Um, and every religion has rituals. So the central ritual of Christianity is, is the Eucharist. Um, but, but every religion has rituals. And what I always tell people is just like, you know, stories without ritual is a book club. Ritual without stories is CrossFit. I love that. Right? Um, amazing. So when you put them together, what you have is a religion. And in those myths, but in that myth part, in that story part, every religion has a philosophy um, in the sense that every religion has an epistemology and an ethics for certain. Some religions have, you know, have developed a, a logic, for example, as well. Um, but every religion has an epistemology. Every religion has has an ethics, and most religions have a cosmology as well, right? A sort of fundamental understanding of what is like, what is the universe, right? What is the um, what is the you know what is it? So. Do I hear my, my Adam joke, by the way? Of course. Why Always. can't you trust Adams? Why? Because they make everything up. They make <laughs> up everything. <laughs> I really like that. Katie and I share a, a, a similar punny sense of humor. I thoroughly enjoy that. Um, so yeah. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess a, a follow-up question on that is how does that come into play with things like stoicism that don't necessarily have ritual in a like christian go to church sense but do encourage certain kinds of meditation or self-reflection yeah so in the pre-christian greco-roman world um many people refer to stoicism epicureanism as religio as religions 
Interesting. Right? Um, the Latin word religio means like discipline or rule. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they refer to them as religions. Um, we tend then as Christianity um, becomes the dominant philosophical persuasion of the, of the Greco-Roman world, um, we tend to then associate religion with the worship of a deity. But as I pointed out um, in my little, in that little dichotomy of what, of what religion needs, um, you don't need the worship of a deity. So the, the obvious example in contemporary world religions is Buddhism. Yeah. So Buddhism Which does not Which I actually not was going to bring up. So. Yeah, Buddhism does not have, now, individual Buddhist cultures frequently maintain the worship of um, pre-Buddhist gods right so buddhism is much more synchronistic than christianity or islam are so if you become a if you become a muslim or a christian part of being a muslim or a christian is you have to renounce the worship of like, previous religious practice or, or, or jewish jewish I, i'm thinking about convert religious with convert like hinduism and judaism are unique because they don't seek converts that's true yeah yeah um so the three the, th the world's three great converting religions right so the world's three great religions that seek converts and that theoretically you can't be sort of the group who the three religions whose membership requires you to believe something so you don't have to believe anything to be a Jew or Hindu you're born Jewish or you're born Hindu um so Buddhism Christianity and Islam um which by the way Buddhism's relationship to Hinduism is much like Christianity and Islam's relationship to Judaism the sort of a universalizing of a tribal religion mm -hmm. sort of an interesting thing there this is not necessarily what you were going at but it's still interesting um they they have um you know buddhism is is less is less is more synchronistic than islam and christianity so islam and christianity to be a muslim to be a christian in part means to renounce the worship of other gods mm -hmm. Because of its link to Judaism, because of both Islam and Christianity is linked to Judaism. Buddhism, which is a daughter religion of Hinduism, does not have that. And so lots of Buddhists, um, you know, if you go to Thailand, if you go to Tibet, if you go to these very Buddhist societies, right? Um, people frequently continue to worship, especially like regular people, right? <laughs> Not people who are like monks or like really into it. Um, regular people tend to worship local gods continue to worship local gods and impose their buddhism on top of that now if you go talk to like the monk in the temple they'll tell you like oh that's probably not a good thing <laughs> but like they're not they're not gonna try to stop it um but that 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 worship is not part of buddhism yeah that's just a cultural remnant of a pre of pre-buddhist religion Buddhism exists alongside Greco-Roman philosophy in, you know, dozens of Greco-Buddhist kingdoms throughout the, you know, thir fourth, third, and second centuries, mm -hmm. roughly. I mean, right. some survive, you know, into the, but, um, and they, those exist, you know, Buddhism existing alongside um, Greco-Roman philosophy. I think uh, we've gone on to a, a bit of a side, this is my fault, I brought us here, because um, I just think it's interesting. Uh, but I would last thing I want to say about religion really quick, and then we should <laughs> refocus back to more philosophy specific. But I do also just think it's interesting to the idea that philosophy has influenced religion and vice versa. The okay. Aristotle, Aristotle is referred to for a very long time, at least in Catholicism, as just the philosopher, and he gets referenced and all of that kind of stuff is very, very important to medieval Christianity and things like that, which I just think is a fascinating thing to think about, like the interplay and the relationship between those things. Well, I would, I mean, I would go so far to, as to argue that Christianity as we know it, right? Mm -hmm. So Christianity, I would say Christianity has, you know, um, clearly the Pauline imprint. So what ha when you, and what you have is this kind of early, G historically speaking, what you have is this early Jesus movement. Um, it's universalized by Paul, like pa mm -hmm. Paul of Tarsus does, you know, yeah. this incredible, um, transforms Christianity really um, into a, a universe, you know, into that conversion universal religion that you join by believing something. Um, but then, you know, for, I'd say, you know, then the next six, six centuries, 
what develops and what we know as Christianity really is the infusion of that Judaic messianic message Mm -hmm. joined with Hellenism and Hellenist philosophy. Which is actually a great comment to bring us a little more backgrounded again. Um, But stay tuned, audience. Katie and I are hoping to do a longer talk at some point, perhaps with some other people about the interplay between Christianity and philosophy specifically, um, and go much more into a deep dive in that at a later date. But for right now, because we're both just interested in it, clearly, as we have talked about it, but we're going to put a pin in that. Stay tuned. We don't know when, but hopefully soon. That's going to be another thing that we discuss somewhere on this channel. Um, But to to root us back for World Philosophy Day, a little more specifically into philosophy, can you talk a little bit more about that, like, uh, Hellenistic tradition specifically, about Hellenism and and, and philosophy and their relationship, aside from just, you know, in many ways that it begins in Athens, at least the way we understand philosophy in the Western world? Yeah, so, I mean, so I think first we should separate the term Hellenistic from Hellenism. Mm -hmm. Um, So Hellenistic is really, I mean, so one of the things that happens that makes Greek culture unique okay, is that with the conquest of Alexander the Great um, in in the late um, fourth century, what you have happen is Greek culture is, and Alexander's Macedonian, like we won't open that bag of worms. He's from Northern Greece-ish. And he was definitely from a part of the world that Greeks were uncertain was Greek or not, okay? So, but he had, Aristotle was his teacher. He had completely absorbed Greek culture. And as he goes out and starts conquering um, Eastern lands, one of the things he does is he carries Greek culture with him. And he doesn't force people to give up their cultural traditions but he adds Greek culture as a sort of layer. And the successor king, of course, Alexander has no, no children. Um, his, his empire is inherited by his generals. And those, what we call the successor kingdoms, what we call Hellenistic in the sense that they're the, the merging of, of Greek culture and, um, and these local cultures. And the, the consequence of that is that Greek culture ceases to be only the culture of a local ethnic group, right? So people right. learn Greek as a second language and every educated person um, in the ancient world knew Greek. People um, use Greek in businesses and culture, sort of like today English operates yeah. a lot um, in that sense, but also it, it becomes a kind of secondary culture and it becomes universalist and this is in a world where nothing's really universalist right where everything's about local um and that's why islam and christianity both draw on that tradition this idea that a religion of philosophies values you know practices can be shared across different ethnic lines is really revolutionary and Greek culture is the first culture that really does that self-consciously. So you have people like Isocrates saying, you know, if any man shares our values, let him call himself a Hellene. Which is on our wall at the museum. It is on our wall. And that's, but if you think about how revolutionary, like to this day, it's not like, you know, some cultures have reached this idea of a cultural identity. America really draws on this idea, right? You can have a cultural, philosophical values identity that trumps your ethnic identity and your political identity. Is I think it's also really interesting that that it's no longer like where you what you are born into is not destiny. Is 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 a really big idea that emerges out of that. The most important thing about it. What Hellenism does, and this, we call that kind of extended Greek. So there's like Greek culture, which is like Spanakopita and your Yaya and the Mati, like that's Greek culture. And then there's, and you can't like, I mean, you can't, you can like kind of become that, right? But like, that's more of like, any, like you know, I could go become Hungarian, I guess, too, you know, and that's. But it, more... it smacks a little more of like joining a family through marriage or yeah. conversion to orthodoxy or something like that. Yeah, it's so different. But Hellenism becomes this thing. This is from the time of Alexander. 
Hellenism becomes an identity you can adopt based on what you believe. And it says the most important thing about you is not where you were born or who you were born, who your parents are, or what king you pay tribute to. The most important thing about you is what your values are. That is grounded in Greek philosophy. It's grounded in the philosophical tradition carried out by Alexander the Great. And it is, it is the first truly universalist um, philosophy in the world. And that's huge, right? This is the philosophical system that gives to the world the value of the individual. And I think it's rooted in that idea that ultimately your, your identity is your choice. Um, and if there's sort of a gift of the Greeks, I would say it's that. That was very well put. Thank you <laughs> for, for talking about Hellenism a little bit more. So let's talk a little bit more about philosophy in our lives then. I think that's a good segue into that. Um, in my, I know that in, in my life, uh, one of my, a lot of my early memories are, and that I still hold, are, are just my dad's kind of like philosophizing about life. And he, he has shaped my worldview in many ways, but um, that's with my mom, but my mom's less inclined to ground it in philosophy in the way that my dad is, which is why he is a little bit more relevant to this particular conversation. Um, he is a big believer in mindfulness. Um, a la the Buddhist tradition of, of mindfulness. That's a, a lot of what I was taught. I grew up in a house where, that was very much, it was very grounded in like mindfulness as like a, a, a thought group, I suppose, about like the way you decide how you engage with your own experiences, that kind of agency piece um, of, of what do you focus on and like what you focus on determines your experience in, in many ways is a philosophy that I was raised with in many ways that I've kind of tweaked for my own purposes and found other things as I've gotten older did you have anything like that in your house that was like really like grilled into you I have a couple others that I will also talk about let's start there though like about how your I think a big thing with philosophy I think is about interpretation of your world and your experiences and how you interpret them affects your experience I think is a big thing that a lot of different philosophies deal with in different ways some of they have different um opinions about what that means but I think that is a big piece of philosophy, at least in, in the contemporary sense. Yeah, so um, I grew up, despite what people might think if they, they, they read what I write occasionally, um, I grew up in a very observant Orthodox Christian home. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a Greek household, I think in, in many ways, a kind of stereotypical diaspora um, Greek household. One of my, you know, um, as you were talking about your dad there, I've seen, you know, one of my earliest memories is of my grandfather and my uncles and my dad and like sort of sitting around the kitchen table with their coffee and their cigars talking. Um, my great grandfather was still alive then as well. Um, he had studied philosophy um, at, at the University of Th at Aristotle University um, at Thess Thessaloniki. Um, and we ver very much, I was very much inculcated early on with a philosophical tradition with the sort of Christian, Christianization of the ancient philosophers, right? That you've seen in the church fathers um, with, that I now recognize as deeply um, emblematic of what happened in the early centuries of Christianity. So um, I was taught that the, you know, I was taught um, a very, I think a very kind of traditionally orthodox, um, though certainly, so I came from a family where people had studied theology and philosophy and things. And so people were sort of interested yeah. in questions of universal salvation, um, which in our family was very much then tied into, um, um, ideas just about Hellenist, you know, Hellenism, Hellenist universalism, mm -hmm. um, gratitude, which I think is, you know, was a very important um, virtue in our home. Um, wisdom, which I think really draws from the sort of, you know, the idea that cultivating wisdom, um, the idea that a lot, you know, Plato says, Socrates said, a, a life, an unexamined life is not worth living. That's a big um, one of my dad's as well. 
And also that um, we are, and I think this was both a Christian and Greek ethic, um, that we are defined by our service to others. Um, and that was about political involvement in my family. It was about philanthropic involvement, right? That, that your life, and I think that came from both a Christian and a sort of more classical Greek place, but that your, your life was, a, you, that you, your life gained value by making yourself of use to others um, was a very important, um, I think, I, I, I suddenly remembered that this was sitting on my nightstand. A, a gift that I received from my dad on my college graduation is called the Tao of Pooh, and it's 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 taking Taoist philosophy through the lens of Winnie the Pooh, which I think is phenomenal. But that, I think it's another thing of like my dad's kind of he he often takes a very kind of he he really likes a lot of the kind of Eastern philosophy about just existing and just being instead of the back of this book says, well, ER frets, piglet hesitates, rabbit calculates, owl pontificates, and Pooh just is. And I think that was a, a lot of the philosophy that I was kind of raised with a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit more about it too. My dad is also, I, I, a lot of the things that I, I feel like I'm going to talk about him a lot because he's just a lot of um, of the isms that I pull up or the the kind of, the my roommates tease me about because I say them so often. There, there are a handful of um, oh, I'm blanking on the word. Like, I guess idioms <laughs> stand by old. Thank you. I could not think of the word. You are correct. That that I stand by that were things that my dad used to say. My favorite one is there are three sides to every story, your side, my side, and the truth, which I'm sure you've heard me say because I say it all the time. Um, so I think I was really raised in a house that encouraged um, awareness of that from a philosophical standpoint, like awareness of like, we are so rooted in our own experience you cannot divorce yourself from that that is just a part of that that's just the reality you can't remove yourself from your own experiences entirely we can do our best to to do that and remain impartial with um mindfulness and being aware of it but you still can't divorce yourself from it i think it's something that we historians talk about as well with historiography and things like that you cannot divorce yourself from your context you can be aware that you are in your context and do your best to uh, new, I mean, suspend your own it. judgment you can do your best to suspend your own judgment in context when examining something but you can never totally do that and that's true in individual interaction as well so that's that's kind of like i think where a lot of my upbringing plays into my philosophy um is, is a lot about self-examination and awareness of others and and things like that and awareness and i keep saying mindfulness but it's, my dad is a big believer in mindfulness of like taking note of what you spend your time thinking about, what you spend your time worrying about and all of that stuff. Like I think self-awareness just in general is kind of core to my own philosophy of life, whatever that means, self-examination as you were yeah. kind of referencing. Yeah, um, well, in the Orthodox tradition, you know, one of the things we learn is that one of the reasons we go to confession is because you cannot know your own heart. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's part of the discipline of, of holy confession is is examining your heart. But you know, we we still say when we, you know, when we say prayers of, of repentance in the Orthodox Church before communion, for example. Um, one of the things we say is, you know, that forgive me for my sins committed in knowledge or in ignorance. And if you kind of look at the great sense, you know, forgive me from the sins that I don't know. I think that's that kind of similar part of like, you shouldn't, there should be ruthless self-examination, but with this, with this caveat that you really don't know yourself ultimately. Um, and that's the work of a lifetime. I think that's a very, I mean, that goes back, I think, to, to Socrates, to Plato. Um, moving out of maybe the way we were raised a little bit, um, have you are there any contemporary philosophers that you found or or philosophies that you found as what not necessarily a contemporary philosopher but philosophies you found as an adult that you kind of like came to and went like oh like yeah i i i like i i like this this is useful to me in some way so i have to always plug him kwame anthony apia who is now at nyu um in their department of philosophy at their school of law he was at princeton previously educated at cambridge also the person with the most interesting life in the world. His father is the nep was the nephew of the King of Ashanti, which is a Ghanaian kingdom. And his mother was Peggy Crisp, 
the daughter of the um essentially like the british the 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 chancellor the exchequer which is like the secretary of the treasury um in britain in the labor government after the war um his parents were on the front page of the times of london when they got married it's the first society interracial marriage um, his husband, Henry Finder, is an editor at The New Yorker. He's literally, his um, nephew what is- a fascinating the, life also. Yeah, his like, nephew is the aside. dancer at the Royal Ballet. This is the world's most interesting family. <laughs> I'm shocked that I've never heard about this before at all. Yeah. Um, Tony, his best friend is Henry Louis Gates. <laughs> this guy is just... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's amazing, but that's so bizarre. I yeah. will put I will put a link in the video description for anyone who's curious for more information about this individual. I'll probably put a bunch of links about stuff we talk about. So he writes great stuff. He, everything he writes is wonderful, but the book I recommend to everyone that he's written is Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers. It is maybe 150 pages. You can get, it's very easily, you can get through it in a couple of days. But it's, you know, his, it's this question of modern cosmopolitanism. So the word cosmopolitan um, was first used by Diogenes of Sinope, who's an ancient Greek philosopher. Um, and I mean, citizen of the world, right? And it was an oxymoron. And one of the questions Apaya asks in, um, in, in this book, Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, is how do we live you know, and it's bar partially from his own life, right? He grew up between two cultures um, and sort of has, a, you know, he was married to an American Jew. Like, I mean, he's sort of lived in these cultural in-betweens. And um, his question is, how do we live with each other and decide what, how we can, you know, what, what, what's ethical behavior when you're living in a world where people don't always agree on right and wrong? How do we make those compromises? What does it mean to be a, cos a rooted cosmopolitan is what he calls it. So someone who recognizes their own cultural identity, appreciates the places and place they come from, um, but who also is open to the world and is willing to take the best ideas from other places and cultures and people and incorporate them into their own life. I will, we'll share the link, it is, I will share that link. I'll also share the time. link to the Tao of Pooh since I brought it up. I feel like I should probably put that in there too. Um, and I will sh I'll maybe share a link to his website. It is, um, I think, you know, he's also written about like honor and the role of honor in moral revolutions. He's writes a bunch of interesting things, but, but cosmopolitanism, you know, I read that book um, for the first time when I was maybe between college and grad school, maybe the beginning mm -hmm. of grad school. Um, I want to think maybe it was right after college, before grad school. So I took a break between college and grad school. I think it was in there that I read it. Um, and it really did, as someone who grew up in a diaspora, as someone who's, I think, always lived sort of an international life, it was an incredibly helpful, it was an incredibly helpful tool of thinking about how I wanted to live my life. And it, it really is, it remains one of the sort of central texts um, in my understanding of myself and the kind of world I want to live in and um, how I want to operate in the world. I'm very excited. I'm going to read that because it sounds like something that I would it's enjoy. Well, it's like, similar in many ways. like it's, yeah. it's not a heavy read. It's not a heavy read. And it's so, I wish, honestly, <laughs> this summer when everyone was reading books that I have like objections to philosophically, quite frankly, um, like bad epistemology and thing. I just wish I could like carpet bomb the country with cosmopolitanism. I love that. Um, I guess it's, that means I, I asked you the question, which means I now have to answer it. Um, <laughs> uh, the thing that I think I, I discovered in college, I largely through my studies, uh, stoicism as a, as a philosophy. I know that it, yours was so interesting and specific <laughs> and like new. Mine is literally ancient, but um, I think it was something that like called on a lot of the things that my dad talked to me about, but like framed it in a slightly different way and, and things like that. It's also been kind of, stoicism, at least in a contemporary sense, has been kind of compared to Buddhist mindfulness philosophy as well, because I do think they share a lot of impulses in there. 
but the thing about it that I always found so appealing is again that idea of like self awareness and self examination of of the the and it's not about being perfect and it and I think the thing with stoicism that I want to say really quickly is is that I think in a contemporary sense it has a tendency to be misunderstood just because the words involved have adopted a different meaning in a contemporary sense so just to put it out there stoic like stoic the word that we use now to mean unemotional is not what stoicism as a philosophy means or purports that's not stoicism is not about not having emotions that's not what the point is um so i'm just gonna say that because i think that's something that gets kind of thrown around a little bit it's words change over time their meaning evolves and it's been several thousand years so it has definitely changed um but just this idea i think it's the core of stoicism and you know marcus aurelius and, and his all of his you know reflections meditate it's called meditations if you're curious to, to read it meditation my father gave me when i graduated from college was was marcus aurelius meditation yeah, I think this just this idea at its and, and I think something that's really interesting about philosophy in our personal lives is the way that we like pull the things that are useful to us sometimes and then leave behind the things that aren't. And I don't think that's bad. There's uh, everything I don't subscribe in my own life to everything in stoicism. It's more of a framework, I think, that I look through sometimes. It's a good reminder for myself when I'm getting particularly focused or worried about something or whatever it, it's kind of grounding i think to me in my life i use philosophy as a way to ground myself again and the thing that i think is so interesting about stoicism sorry one more that's time how orthodoxy functions in my, i didn't interrupt you like that's how orthodoxy yeah. functions in my life essentially right yeah i i wouldn't say that i'm a terribly philosophical person in the sense that i don't spend my whole life like or a lot of my life thinking about philosophy or meaning in that way but when I am facing challenges, it grounds me again in like my worldview. And I guess my worldview at its core is kind of about like self-awareness and the way that we engage with others is kind of what I think about the most. Um, but I, I've told Katie this before, but something in college, I often made jokes that I'm an optimistic nihilist, which I know kind of sounds like a, a contradiction in many ways, and I understand that. But for the basic tenets of, or one of the main tenets of nihilism is the idea that like nothing really matters. Um, like there's no like grand plan or there's no point to life necessarily. There's no purpose, so to speak. And for some, and understandably so, it's viewed as a kind of defeatist philosophy perhaps or fatalist philosophy. And I certainly understand that. there are certainly many nihilistic philosophers who take that route. But to me, the way I think, and this is the reason I bring this up is because I think something that's really interesting about philosophy is the way we interpret it in our own lives. Um, and that's a big piece of philosophy. I think it's also a big piece of religion, right? It's a, the, the act of interpretation and application in individual lives. And to me, what it meant at the time was nothing mattering in that sense didn't, didn't feel defeatist to me. To me, it kind of gave me some agency, the way that I interpreted it is the idea that like well if nothing matters in a grand cosmic sense then i get to decide what matters to me since there's not a rule or whatever like a central tenant or function it means that i get to decide what is meaningful to me in my life um which i think and that was kind of before i came up against stoicism in a very direct way so i think that once i like found stoicism a little bit more i was like oh this is my weird optimistic nihilist thing is actually kind of sort of in line with stoicism as well I think I, mean, it, I think it, you actually make a good point about what the role of philosophy is right and I think that's whether that comes to people through sort of philosophy or through um or through religion that is the vehicle of that philosophy I think it's true you know when we say like every everyone is a philosopher I think that the truth is um if you have not come to a moment in your life where you needed to understand the function of the world at a deeper level than just like the mechanics um it's coming i always tell my students like if you haven't if you haven't had something bad happen to you yet just wait <laughs> um if you have not you know if you have not encountered something in your life whether that's you know great joy or great sorrow um you know i think death the, you know, falling in love, the death of someone you love, um, so, you know, extreme physical suffering of some kind, extreme emotional suffering of some kind. Um, everyone, it's impossible to live a human life and not encounter that, 
right? Um, holding it, you know, holding the newborn baby. Um, it's impossible to, to live a human life and not have these moments of real um, sort of existential pondering, right? To really come face to face with everything it means to be human. And I think, you know, I think there's, there's actually a lot of research on this, you know, it's like, psychiatric research you know people do better when they have some sort of value system to rely on and when they have ritual to rely on by the way right when they have some something to do um and that may not necessarily be religious ritual but when they have some sort of when they've been given tools to really deal with that um i think that's important and you know the way you're describing i think you're sort of maybe and I mean atheistic in like the technical sense. And I know there's people in the comments, but you know what I mean. Um, Kyra knows what I mean. She's my friend and that's all I care about. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that is, right. So I think when you say like nothing matters, I think that's a similar response when I get here's to what I had, which is, so my mother would always say, you know, her way of dealing with like, or her way, if you'd come to her with, where you come to her still with kind of big problems or like, she'll say, is this going to matter at the resurrection? Like, is this going to matter at the resurrection? And it is about changing that perspective. Like this, I think it's the same thing, right? This matters a lot to me right now. And whether you say, well, that's nothing matters. Or I think, I mean, kind of what I'm coming up with, yeah, nothing matters, nothing everything or you know it matters you know this isn't going to matter because there's something bigger at at work here and so i don't need to worry about this right? yeah. like i think that like is it going you know is it going to matter to me at the resurrection that my you know i lost my debit card no, <laughs> no it's not. right and i, I think it's I, I think the thing that philosophy gave me i guess if we're gonna go weird and feely about it which I'm making us do the, the thing that philosophy gave me because I, I don't I don't you know I, I've referenced stoicism a lot and you know mindfulness and Taoism and, and things um but I honestly for someone who thinks about things a lot philosophy is not something that I think about on a daily basis I don't think um in in, in like an explicit way it's more of just like these things that I've come to believe or these habits I've come to develop for my own self-reflection that are just become like impulses that I have now, I guess, for better or for worse, hopefully for better in many ways. But I, it's, you know, something that I've, I've, and the other thing I think is that I think is interesting about philosophy is that it's actually, it's not just something you believe, it's like a practice in many ways. It's, it, it's something that's active that you have to kind of, and that was something that my dad really encouraged me to think about is like, it's not just about having a set of belief systems necessarily, or like, I believe X. It's, it's, a, it's it's a muscle in in many ways it's like a muscle you develop Abraham in your Lincoln. perspective so now you know maybe the stoic in me or, or just the fact that I've been kind of ingrained with this idea that so much of your experience is dependent on your own interpretation of what happens and your perspective and what you focus on that we have some kind of agency in our world and I got a disclaimer and say I'm not saying that any situation can be fixed by switching your perspective on it. This is not like grand life tragedy or things like, but just in day-to-day -day little, little things, something that I've found in my life helpful is, is switching up just the way I think about things. If like something difficult happens, the flip that I have found useful in my own life is, okay, so what did I learn? Instead of dwelling on this didn't go so well or, or beating myself up about something. Part of, I think my dad's focus on this with me as a kid was that I, did and still do have a tendency to be hard on myself and so it was like okay let's flip the perspective it's not about what did i do wrong it's how do i do better next time times like like finding those perspective shifts i think so it's not necessarily in my life that like i sit every day and even though i mean uh stoics would tell you to i don't i don't meditate even though i have talked a lot about philosophy but it's more about developing the muscle to to reframe for myself and have that become integrated into my natural reaction of I feel my feelings and that's okay and they're good and they're valid and you need to feel your feelings and process your feelings. But the difference between like processing your feelings and recognizing them as valid and um, then once you've processed them instead of dwelling, 
developing that reaction, that automatic muscle of let me reframe this a little bit. And it's honestly, it's, it's just, it's a selfish thing in many ways. And just that I'm happier when I do that. I'm a happier person when I do that. <laughs> well, I think, I, 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 so I disagree. I think you probably do think about philosophy more than you think. You're, you're, I mean that I don't explicitly sit there and go, I'm going to think about this stoic oh, no, okay, yeah, yeah. actively. Sorry, clarifying. You're right. Yes. Clarify what I mean. I'm yeah. not sitting here in my house every day, like Marcus Aurelius says. So I need, like, it's just, it's become just oh, yeah. a part of the way I engage with the world. It's, it's ingrained itself into my perspective. Because I was gonna say, I think most of us think about like our ethics, right? We think about because yeah. we have to like make ethical choices all the time. But I also think we, I mean, our epistemology matters, right? So like, how do we know, you know, epistemology is a branch of philosophy that deals with knowledge, right? How we, how do we know things? Right? Um, what is, you know, what is knowledge? Um, how do you know things? What is truth? If you and I have a fundamental difference in what reality is, one of the ways we can actually get at the root of that problem is for you to explain to me where you're getting that, you know, where you're drawing that reality from. And so I wonder right. if the fact that a lot of this does go unarticulated or that we only articulate it on the basis of ethics and not that kind of deep next level is part of the problem. Does that um, make sense? Like, I wonder if it would be cool to society if maybe we started talking about like, why do you like, if you and I can't agree about what facts are, basically, <laughs> which is, right. I guess that's actually what's happening right now, right? Like, that is the mm -hmm. nature of the debate. It's like, I, we cannot agree about what facts are. Not you and I, but the world. Kind of. Royal we, the world. So, yeah. Um, the world. Um, would, it be, would it be helpful if we had people say, like, what is truth to you? What are the standards yeah. you're applying to truth? The last thing that I, I want to ask you about is um, we've discussed this a little bit, but the idea that some people feel like, uh, well, philosophy is not something that is developed for people, uh, pe philosophers, people who develop actual philosophy aren't usually people who show up and like at 20 are like, here's my philosophy on life. There are things that are developed at a later stage, perhaps retroactively or looking backwards. What, like, what are your thoughts on that? There's a really interesting, um, I think was it, maybe it was William Faulkner, Tennessee Williams, one of those Southern writers um, who said there's a reason there's no literary prodigies, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like musical prodigies, there's mathematical prodigies, things that are like skills-based, there's like prodigies. No, there are no philosopher prodigies, right? So anything that's about literature, philosophy, anything that's about understanding how life works is not something that people are going to be good at immediately or when they are young you know, um, but I, I think for me the thing that I think is so interesting about philosophers is this idea that like it, it it's the way you go back and re-examine your life and your experiences with different contexts over time um and and new, it's about incorporate. So if the data of philosophy is life, is the experience of life, right? Mm -hmm. A good scientist changes his hypothesis based on the data. Right. That's a very good analogy, Katie. And I try occasion. That's my one good thought for 2020. Over with. I thought um, we were going to say for today, and then you said 2020. No, I think, I mean, you have to include and so people who do this for a living, right, who think about stuff, um, and logic is the dominant form of academic philosophy right now, which is very boring, but um, people who think for a living in any way um, are going to, and I think this is true both of sort of professional philosophers and of, you know, all of us, our many philo philosophical fiefdoms, um, as you go through life, if you are, if you're doing the job that the Socrates of Plato sets up for you, which is undergoing, you know, or that, you know, the church fathers recommend or that Seneca recommends or Marcus Aurelius recommends or the Buddha recommends. Um, if you're doing that work, which is, real, or the Sufi mystics, right? If you're doing what every- That's one my mom actually really loves. 
But I'm glad you brought that up. That was the one philosophy my mom used to reference a lot when I was a kid. Every wisdom tradition that we talk, or the or the rabbis, the Talmudic, you know, the rabbis, um, every wisdom tradition, one of the core principles of the wisdom traditions is ruthless self-examination. I mean, AA even, right? <laughs> like literally every, you know, um, that you should constantly be interrogating your own soul. Yeah. And if you're doing that, if you're doing that with any sort of discipline, if you're doing that through prayer or meditation or, you know, long walks or being married or, you know, all those things that sort of call you to, um, call you to be or having or being a parent or being a teacher or any of those things in our lives that call us to be you know to expose ourselves more fully um as you are doing those things you're going to learn more things and i think at the what it usually i think if people are not doing it right but i think the the effect i've noticed is people tend to be tempered I think, um, I think people who are the people I know who have really lived lives of introspection are people who, um, I talk about my papu George all the time, who I, as far as I'm concerned, was the greatest human being who ever lived. Um, but, you know, I think about him who, you know, he was a man of, of deep faith. He was a man of very certain principles, but he also had this sort of compassion um that I think was the result of experience right and that's what the the wisdom traditions at their best call us to that I think that's a, a, a lovely place to end actually I think empathy is such an important thing and I think many 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 philosophies talk about empathy stoicism being one of them I really appreciate you coming to join us on our world philosophy day talk <laughs> Uh, we also have a little bit of an announcement, Katie and I, this is actually kind of an interesting video to come out right now because it's a little more similar in form to a new project that Katie and I have been working on than the rest of our videos on this channel have been. We are going to be launching a podcast in December uh, called NHM Dialogues, and it's going to be Katie and I primarily, and we'll have some guests who rotate through. We may not both always be there, but at least one of us will always be there. We would never leave you alone. Um, yeah, yeah, and we're going to examine a lot of things from philosophy uh, to mythology. Our, our first episode in December is going to be about uh, Katie, our lovely resident scholar and someone who was raised in the Greek diaspora, teaching me Cairo and not in Greek about Ohide is, is, is going to be our first. And we'll be followed quickly by a, a two-part two episode, I suppose, about uh, mythology. Uh, specifically gender and mythology so if any of that is interesting to you keep an eye out you can subscribe to our social media with uh, the links in the video description to hear more or go to our website and subscribe to our newsletter and you'll hear all about it um, but our new podcast is going to be coming in December it's going to be a little more similar in form to what you just watched than the rest of our channel um, it was a teaser to the podcast sure yeah this is a teaser to the podcast and this video will probably end up in podcast form on the podcast probably a longer uncut version of this video will end up being in the podcast. So if you're curious, the stuff that didn't make it into the final cut of this video and want to hear more about probably Katie and I's more personal thoughts, uh, check out the podcast. Um, we appreciate you coming to hang out with us. Uh, happy World Philosophy Day. And happy World Philosophy Day, Cairo. Happy World Philosophy Day, Katie. If you have thoughts about your own philosophies or things that you think are really interesting, feel free to th throw them in the comments or any other philosophers that we left out that you think we should have talked about, put it in the comments. We'd love to see. And uh, all, many of the things that we referenced today will also be in the video description. So we, you can check it out. To, to, <laughs> yes, to, to see Katie's cosmopolitan uh, perspective and all sorts of other things. All that will go in the, in the description. So we appreciate you coming by to hang out with us on World Philosophy Day and Bye. enjoy.